as much as there are attempts to make this a the two sides thing, there's actually one overwhelming colonial power and there is one occupied colonized people and they are not the same. In theory, at least, all the knowledge, all the information is out there for us to reach, right? Mm -hmm. Smartphones or whatever we use in order to reach. The question is whether we would like to actually venture out and try to pursue that knowledge and, and especially, I think, whether we are willing to, to criticize ourselves because we all have certain preconceived notions. And the question is to what extent we're willing to challenge ourselves. And there are many ways to go about doing that. But I think that we've seen throughout the chronicles of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but even more so since October 7, is unwillingness on the overwhelming and increasingly larger part of both populations to challenge themselves, to go through certain soul searching. And I think that uh, both publics very much need to do that. Now, Miriam, you mentioned that Israel is now being ruled by a very extremist right-wing governments, and I'm completely with you on that. Before October 7, up until that very day, for nine months before that, we were taking to the streets uh, every week and often enough twice or three times a week in order to protest against my own government attempts to basically undermine, if not abolish, Israel's democracy. I think that this government is a dangerous one. I also think that Hamas government is a very, very dangerous one. And not just for Israelis, very much for Israelis too. I mean, you just have to just simply read, right? The way that I said, just Google Hamas Covenant. What you will see there is a plan from 1988, apropos the history of the conflict, from 1988, with a very clear agenda that, you know, they do not hide to eradicate the state of Israel and to perform genocide against the Jewish people. This is very explicit in the, their covenant, which they have not canceled. It's very much there. So this is a basic fact that one can refer to. And just two years before October 7, Hamas have gathered a momentous conference in Gaza that Israelis, the Israeli intelligence, the might Israeli intelligence refused to believe what was going on there. They've basically outlined the day after destroying Israel. The day after destroying Israel, uh, you know, many Israelis will be killed. Uh, some Israelis will be put into forced labor. Not myself, academics, for example. They said certain academics are very important. Mathematicians, physicians, etc., because they've exploited the Palestinians enough and their knowledge is sufficiently useful. So they will be put still in Israel until they, they are sufficiently usable. The rest of us can be killed or, or expelled. They divided the land, Israel, the way that it will be ruled by, by Hamas, so they can perform their uh, idea of a caliphate that doesn't end with Israel. The agenda of Hamas is to free the whole land of Palestine because it is considered an Islamic waqf, um, a sacred land that one should release from any sort of foreign invaders, the way the Jews are, and it goes far further than just 70 years ago. I mean, the very presence, any sort of political presence, even if it was just a small autonomy of, I don't know, 2,000 Jews somewhere in the land of Israel, that would be an abomination. Jews may be allowed under certain circumstances to stay on the land, but in an inferior status. Okay, that's the perspective of Hamas. And Hamas has been implemented many of those uh, uh, Islamist notions vis-a-vis their own population. Look, the low point, the low point of support for Hamas was on the eve of the attack. If you look at public opinion polls throughout the summer and the autumn before October 7, the support for Hamas in the Gaza Strip, okay, was below 20%. And then come October 7, and everything goes to hell. And overnight, overnight, you see the numbers going up. Partly, yes, because of the stupidity and the cruelty of the current Israeli government, definitely so. But one thing that I know as much as I can say for sure, it does not help, is that we keep on looking at this conflict as if it is an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It is not. It is not two people against each other, okay? If you go to my hometown, to Jerusalem, okay, you will see Jews and Arabs on a daily basis sitting next to each other, talking on the train. They go to the hospital. If I'm going to the hospital, as I have recently, okay, I would be treated by an Arab physician, an Arab nurse. Okay? Our neighbors are Arabs. We have much more correspondence, coexistence, so to speak, than the way that it is often portrayed. And instead of helping the people who do want to live together, which are the overwhelming majority, what we have seen is that 
in many circles, media and academia alike, worldwide, people have been buying into this narrative that everyone are like this or everyone are like that. They are not. The overwhelming majorities of Israeli, Israeli Jews and Palestinians, Arab Muslims, Christians, can live together if we manage to hold hands and fight together those radical elements. But in order to do it, we have to look that reality in the eyes, okay? And not yield again and again to those radicals. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Miriam, so we've heard from Muriel that actually truth is being, there's a fight over truth amongst these power blocks, be they Hamas leaders, be they the, the Israeli government. Um, what was striking about your pitch was how much you brought this back down to what ordinary people are experiencing. So, I mean, what, what do you sort of, what, what do you feel about that? What, what does the truth matter to ordinary people? A bit like, you know, as, as Uriel's just described, you know, the ordinary people living together along, you know, um, where, he, where he is from. You know, does, what, is, is truth much more complex for them about this whole, whole fight? It's a very simple issue. And in fact, part of the, the propaganda machine involves to, to, talking about this as if it's two sides. It's just two sides. No, we have an occupying power, which is funded to the tune of billions by the United States and receives billions of dollars of aid to, to drop 2,000 pound bombs on a civilian population encaged with nowhere to flee to. And then you have a civilian population which has zero control on any of its exit routes, any of its movements, and in fact is controlled under a form of colonial bureaucracy which uh, essentially uh, attributes different forms of um, rights to different Palestinians. We he heard a reference here to uh, Arab Israelis. They're not Arab Israelis, they're Palestinians who have Israeli ID. They were people who in many cases ethnically cleanse from their homes or who have been given the choice to remain in their homes and to live under a second class form of citizenship. Not me saying it, this is reports by Amnesty International, by Human Rights Watch, which show that Palestinians live under a form of apartheid throughout all of the territories occupied by Israel. When we talk about extremism in Israel, um, and I think that that's far more significant because of the power imbalance we're talking about, there were so many points of misinformation. In 2017, Hamas, for example, um, uh, altered their charter uh, to uh, de facto recognize the state of Israel. No, because that's false. I'm still speaking. Uh, which is, uh, no, that's factually correct, and we can discuss this later, but you don't get to interrupt me when I'm talking. Thank you. Um, in 2017, no, thank you. In 2017, there's a de facto recognition of the 1967 borders, which essentially means a two-state solution. But ultimately, this focus on Hamas is a distraction. Hamas does not have the support of the majority of Palestinians. In fact, even the poll he cited there is incorrect. Even in the week after the October the 7th attack, Palestinians, even in the West Bank did not majoritarily support Hamas. There just haven't been elections in these territories, which of course has suited Netanyahu because he has used Hamas as a bogeyman to justify never having to engage in peace negotiations with the Palestinians. Because again, as much as there are attempts to make this a the two sides thing, there's actually one overwhelming colonial power and there is one occupied, colonized people and they are not the same. They don't have the same reach in terms of the narrative and they don't have the same reach over each other's lives. You talked about the Hamas Charter, uh, you know, laying out this genocidal vision. We don't need to be speculative when we talk about Israel's genocidal vision. It's happening right now. And for you to discuss a hypothetical generic you know, genocide that is not happening at a time when an actual genocide is ongoing is frankly distasteful and, in my opinion, disgraceful. There are now plenty of polls that show that it's not just a fringe within Israeli society. I wish I could tell you it was. I lived in Jerusalem, I lived in the occupied territories. The situation has got worse. Are there Israeli peace builders? Absolutely, and thank God for those people. But they are a minority. They are today deeply embattled. They live in fear for their own security and they cannot be public about their opposition. They got, and in, otherwise they receive much of the same treatment meted out to the Palestinians. When we talk about the Israeli public, a poll in December 2023 showed that uh, asked, this poll asked Israeli Jews, to what extent should Israel take into consideration the suffering of the civilian population in Gaza when planning continuing the fighting? 
80% said to a very small or fairly small extent. There is a massive dehumanization of the Palestinian population by Israel, unfortunately, that has filtered deep down into Israeli society, which is why we find TikToks of regular Israelis making fun of mothers losing their children. It's why we see pseudo rap tracks trying to eulogize what Israel is doing in Gaza, which by all intents and purposes is horrific. It is objectively horrific. And so this idea that it's just a minority of Israel, Israelis who are caught up in, a, in, in an extremist narrative, I'm afraid that's part of the spin. And don't be caught up in the spin that gets you focusing on Hamas when actually the majority of people who are being killed in Gaza today and who are being ethnically cleansed in the West Bank today are Palestinians. They are not Hamas supporters. They are Palestinians. Full stop. The war Israel is waging today is against Palestinians and it always and has always been that that's at stake here. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.